Hello, everybody. How are you today? It's, uh, well, it's early morning. Um, I guess I'm coming to you a little early. Um, sometimes I don't have a chance to uh, bring you this series um, during the day because I work. And sometimes I kind of find different times of the day or night when I can. So, and sometimes the Holy Spirit just knocks on my shoulder and says, you know, it's time for you to look in your form and see what's knocking. This has been a topic of great conversation on the forum. Um, if some of you don't know my forum, it's um, called Catholic Church and the Reformation. Um, I'm going to leave another link on the post after I'm done to the forum so you can go in there and check it out, see what you think. Um, a little while ago, I gave a discussion on um, Peter the Rock. I, I think that it was a very, well, it was a very short, condensed discussion. I think I only had like 20, 25 minutes. I was really on the air with, accompanied by um, a colleague, a friend of mine, and he had the whole thing set up and he's in another state, Ohio, and I'm in Illinois. It's, it's a very complicated kind of way to explain it. But he had a ways of making things come together, but he had a, you know, he's, a, he's got a family. I don't have a family, so I can do this anytime I want, as long as I want. And I wanted to take the time to, um, as you can see the topic, I wanted to give you folks a little understanding about something that is really a barn burner. And that is really um, the question of, was Peter in Rome? I hear this a lot, you know, on my forum, and I respectfully, you know, I understand. I understand how, you know, some of our um, Christian brothers and sisters in Christ who are not Catholic may have a difficulty with this um, because it's not in the Bible, right? If it's not in the Bible, you know, I mean, how can you believe it, right? Well, the table of contents are in the Bible, but how did they get there? That's a whole other story, which actually you'll find if you read if, or if you visited my video on you, my YouTube channel, um, which I'm passing around to folks. I'm, I think I have it on my um, page, on my, on my um, page, okay? So you can join my and subscribe to my uh, videos. I have, I'm making them as the Holy Spirit you know, wants me to, you know, whatever, whatever comes up, I'm going to give it. All right. I want to clarify. My role is to clarify. Apologetics is to clarify the teaching, you know, get, get the fog out, clean it out, you know, make it clear, crystal clear. Not, not that faith is not, you know, we don't see everything in crystal light, but I want to crystal what it is that we believe as Catholics. So let me get back to this um, topic. You know, um, was Peter in Rome? Well, we certainly know from history that many of the early church fathers, bishops, patriarchs, Eastern patriarchs, a lot of Eastern patriarchs, folks, a lot of Eastern patriarchs, um, a lot of Eastern early church fathers were not bishops who spoke very clearly that Peter was in Rome. He established a see there, which means he established a church, um, which was above all other churches, uh, which means not, you know, like lording over, although down the history people you know popes have gotten into trouble with that um but you know i mean peter got, all you got to do is open up the bible and read some passages on peter and how many times jesus chastised him about what he did i mean he calls him a rock one minute and gives him the keys to heaven and earth and the next what verse or two he calls him get behind me you satan 
I mean, you know, I mean, popes are not free from sin and even error. I want to, I want to clarify that, but in another time, okay? Because I don't want to muddy the waters a little bit. When I say that, I mean you can read on John twenty, John, uh, Pope John the twenty second. Some of you priests out there know exactly what I'm talking about. This Pope actually. 13th century believed that you know something about a beatific vision where only certain people or whatever in some kind of convoluted way but he did repent of that before he died okay having said that let's get back to our subject at hand um so we'll talk about the sins of the popes and all that other some fun stuff down the road but i'm going to make this is going to be a series all right first series was peter the rock again it wasn't clearly done perfectly but as best as i could have done under the timeline that i was given okay so we're talking about peter and rome um i'm sure some of you are aware of the excavations that took on their role in the let's say the 40s and 50s I think maybe early 60s, but the 50s mainly, um, and even the 60s, actually, I think the 60s, because I know Pope Paul VI mentioned this, that Peter was buried in Rome. They were digging. They were digging under the Vatican, you know, to you know where the catacombs are and everything. And they came to um, a place where it was written, you know, uh, and I, I may not be exactly certain of the phraseology, but it's said very clearly, Peter, li Peter lies here, or, you know, something to that nature. He dug it up, and there was a man that was about the size of what, you know, who Peter would have been, you know, and, uh, as archaeologists have found out over the years. Um, How do we begin to assert, besides archaeological, you know, findings that Peter was in Rome? Well, we have, folks, we have history on our side. You know, if I, if I don't know something, I go to the Britannica, I'll go to the encyclopedia.com, I'll go to some reference source, I'll, I'll even go to Catholic Answers. Now I know you folks will say, well, it's a sectarian group. I don't mind sectarian, you know, religious websites. I don't mind having sources from religious websites so long as those sources are linked to something that is tangible. And I'm not talking about faith here. I'm talking about whenever a person is discussing history on my forum. I'm very strict about this. I'm sorry, I have to be. If you're giving an opinion about your faith, that's fine. If you're giving your faith belief, that's excellent. Do it, all right? Please, I want you to, so that we can debate it. That's what my forum is about. Um, but in any case, in some cases, some people will throw out stuff like, a friend of, you know, a co I don't know what to call him, I don't even know if he likes me very much, but he'll say that uh, there were no popes before 606 AD. All right, so, okay, so, all right, you know what I'm ta what we're trying to go get at, all right? So that's, you know, if we start reading um, some of the clear guidelines of, Peter and how he got to Rome and where do we get that? Where do we get that? We get that through the mouths of the early church. We go to the early church. We can't start anywhere else. And by the way, when we go into the Bible, we have to understand something. The early Christians were persecuted, folks. They were they were run after. They were sought after. 
there was great persecution in the early church. You know, the, the Christians had to figure out, listen, how are we going to survive? They were realistics. They were real people. They're not, you know, they weren't just, I believe, you know. Well, yeah, I believe, but, you know, they had to be practical too. You know, someone knocking on someone's door and, you know, someone's hiding a Christian. He's going to lie. No, there's no Christians here. Well, sorry. It, that's, you're protecting a, fellow, a Christian. There are certain things we say that are not sinful. We're protecting the life, the life of someone else. That's not sin. Um, there was a book out some time ago, way, way back when, by Lorraine Botner, in a best-known book called Roman Catholicism. I hate that one title, Roman. You know, it's like me calling the American Baptists or the New Zealand Baptists or Baptists. That's all. I just call, you know, if you're a Baptist, you're a Baptist. That's it. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't care where you come from. Catholicism is not based solely in Rome. You know, I'm not Roman Catholic because I'm not living in Rome. I am Roman Catholic by the style of worship that I believe in. You know, in other words, when I go to mass, there is a Roman ritual, Roman rite, R-I-T-E. But there's also a Byzantine rite, which is in union with the Sea of Peter in Rome, not Antioch, by the way. We'll get to that later. In Rome, okay? And there's many other Eastern churches. In fact, all counterparts of the Eastern Orthodox now belong to the Catholic Church in union with Rome. The whole Catholic Church all over the world is united to Rome. Some people will say, well, you know, Egypt has a few thousand Eastern Chaldean Christians or Coptic Christians that are Catholic of the, of the, Chalde, of the Coptic rite. So what? Let there be only two or one. But there is a Coptic Catholic Church. Okay? And, he, and it is in union with Rome. And that is a blessing. Because there's that unity that they share with the patriarchate of the Orthodox Church. And they get along okay. They get along very well, actually. I've, I've, I've read stories, situations. Um, so as I'm, I wanted to bring this up with about this little Lorraine Bodner. Um, you know, he, he recalls the fact that it's all just legend. You know, Peter could not be in Rome. It's legend. Um, you know, there's, there's this illusion that the belief of Peter, Peter's residency in Rome, is somehow a figment of our imagination, of Catholic imagination. It doesn't rest, it's not biblical. See, again, it's not written in the Bible, in the pages of the Bible. Well, I'm sorry, but he, not all history is written, you know. Some history is written in various other areas, you know. Remember, history is not infallible. You know, I can't, I can't open up a science book and, and say, well, you know what, the, the Earth is, a billion, is, six, is three billion years old. Where, you know, the, but the Bible is only 6,000 years old. The Old Testament combined with the New Testament is 6,000 years old. I think so. I hope I'm right. Um, sure as heck studied a lot of that. Um, so where do you get the other several billion? 2.7 billion? <laughs> you know? Moses is the author of the book of Genesis is what most scholars agree. The book of Genesis has three books in it. 
And that's what most scholars, most theologians will tell you that. Some will say two, some will say three. Our scholars, scholarship in the Catholic Church says three. And I think Lutherans believe that too, not sure. And Episcopalians, I'm sure, they don't have any problem believing in a lot of things. So I'm not gonna go there right now. <laughs> um, and the topic arises a lot in the, Old Test in the New Testament Concerning the term Babylon, well, folks, you know, when, when Paul is writing to the, the church in Rome, he doesn't go out and he doesn't, you know, just follow strictly, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm writing to Peter in Rome. But yeah, he's going to give up. Uh, the top figure of the apostles so that when those letters start passing through and those Romans intercept them, sure, he's going to just write, you know, Peter's name out there. It's like a death sentence, folks. Come on. <laughs> you know, I don't think, you know, Paul was there, okay? You know, he, had, he was very scholarly, by the way, so I'm sure he knew what he was doing. Um... So, you know, as we discuss this segment, there's such a bunch of things to really throw out, you know, and to talk about. Um, what we have to also take a look at is Paul's journey and the city that is recorded in great detail, Acts 27 and 28. There is, in fact, no New Testament evidence or any historical proof of any kind, that's obvious, that Peter was ever in Rome. That's according to Lorraine Botner, not me, okay? So when we start looking at the Bible, we understand that it is a code word. Babylon is a code word for Rome, and people don't understand that. Um, if I look at, um, I don't know if I'm going to find it, but I'm going to try. I always I like to use this big Bible here. Um, now I know in Revelations, Babylon is mentioned uh, a few times. It, it's talking about Rome, folks. Okay, but Revelation isn't interested in Babylon, a small little village, you know, where nothing is happening at that point. It's dried up. It's not. It's not the Babylon of the, you know, two or three BC. Okay, it believe me, it isn't. Trust me. Uh, you can you can research that yourself. Let me see if I can locate just a little bit of a on Revelations, just to give you a little bit of an insight. Okay, look at chapter seventeen of the book of Revelations, Babylon the Great. Let me read this to you. Um, Bab this is uh, verse 5, by the way. Okay, On her forehead was written a name which is a mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk on the blood of the holy ones and on the blood of the witnesses of Jesus Christ. What do you think Jesus' apostles, Jesus' disciples, what do you think they went to preach the gospel to? They went to Rome. Paul, Paul writes to Rome. We all know that Rome was the great persecutor of Christians, folks. We have it right there in the book of Revelations. That book of Revelations is quoting Rome as Babylon.
So sure, Lorraine Bottner is quoting the fact that there's no allusion to Rome in either of Peter's epistles. Of course not. You know, there is in the greeting at the end of the first epistle, the church here in Babylon, united with you by God's election, sends you her greeting, and so does my son Mark, 1 Peter 5.13. Again, Babylon being the code word for Rome, it is used that way multiple times in works like the Sibylline Oracles, the Apocalypse of Baruch, 2 1, 4 Esdras, some of these not, you know, Protestant books people consider um, deuterocanonical. Um, Now Eusebius Pamphilius in the Chronicle, composed about AD 303, about the fourth century, okay? The beginning of the third, you know, the ending of the third. Noted that it is said that Peter's first epistle in which he makes mention of Mark was composed at Rome itself. So, the epistle where Peter, First Peter 5.13, and that is written, by the way, a commentary by Knox, um, is said by Eusebius in 303 AD that that epistle was composed in Rome by Peter. That's the first indication let's see if we have something a little more you know clearer than that of course we can go on and see if we can get some more a little tighter a little stronger i also want to ask you folks get yourselves the book those of you that are interested in early church history i know some of you um i've heard it will tell me that, well, this book does not have the whole composition of the early fathers. Beginners don't need whole compositions of the fathers. Do you know how many writings of the fathers there are from the first century to the eighth century? It's the 700s. I believe St. Thomas Damas, Damascus or Dam Damasus is, was the last, considered the last father of the early church. 700s goes pretty deep into the church there in the first century, in the first thousand years, millennia. I recommend highly getting a hold of the three volume set, The Faith of the Early Fathers, which is a compendium. It cites at length everything from the Didache to John Damascene, includes 30 references to this question, this very question of Peter and Rome. It states very very clearly, Peter came to Rome and died there. Peter established his see at Rome and made the Bishop of Rome his successor in the primacy. That you will find in this set of the early fathers. And we're gonna to get to the early fathers. And just slow down, it's okay. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of milk first, you know, like Paul says. <laughs> so Get the early fathers, get the faith of the early fathers by William A. Jurgens, spelled J U R G E N S. Get the book. Well, let's see here. We got Tertullian. You, many of you must have heard of Tertullian if you're, you know, if you're familiar somewhat with our forum. Um, and with the early church, in the demure against the heretics, this is AD 200, folks. The beginning of the third century, probably just about the ending of the second. This is only 200 years after Christ, folks. Not, not that long ago. Think about this for a second. We are about... Not, what 250 years after America was found was given the independence 
You know, the first president of the United States was George Washington. We have no problems figuring out where he was. He was in here in America. <laughs> Come on. Surely we can read history, right? You know, it's not something I'm hiding. You know, I researched all this stuff. I dug it up in my university days. So let's see what, he, what Tertullian writes, okay, 200 AD. How happy is that church where Peter endured a passion like that of the Lord, where Paul was crowned in a death like John's. Of course, he's referring to John the, the Baptist, both he and Paul being beheaded, okay? Now, some fundamentalists, I'm talking about the fundamentalists, okay? You know who you are. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it like it is because many of you do like the word. I'm a fundamentalist. I'm proud of it. If you don't like it, tell me. You know, it's fine. But I have, to, I have to say it like it is. Some fundamentalists will admit Paul died in Rome. Yeah. So the implication from Tertullian is that Peter also must have been there, since Tertullian is mentioning both, Peter and Paul. It was commonly accepted from the very first that both Peter and Paul were murdered at Rome, probably in the Neronian persecution of the 60s. In the same book, Tertullian wrote that this is the way in which the apostolic churches transmit their lists. This is the way they transmit their lists, like the Church of the Smyrnaeans, which record that Polycarp was placed there by John. Like the Church of the Romans, where Clement was ordained by Peter. Interesting, huh? This is Tertullian speaking. In, two, in around 280, could have been 189, could have been. Note that Tertullian didn't say Peter consecrated Clement as Pope. He doesn't say that. He ordained Clement. Ordaining, ordination is not the same as ordaining someone to the episcopate of whatever diocese. He could have ordained him as a priest, presbyter, presbyteros in Greek, okay, presbyter. English transliteration is basically priest. Okay, so where are we right now? We're with Tertullian. We'll stick with him for a while, I guess. A pope doesn't consecrate his own successor. Now, down the road, we're going to discuss that a little more with like meat and potatoes kind of thing. A pope can appoint his own successor. Yes, he can. Some of us wish that maybe uh, Benedict XVI would have done that. But I guess we can't ask for everything, right? All right, whatever. So anyway, we go on and we see here about Clement now. Um, and it says here now, I didn't even know this. I blurted it out. He says himself that, now this is Tertullian. He's saying that he merely ordained Clement as a priest. I was right on. I was spot on. I knew it. I felt it. I mean, I you know usually you ordain someone first as a priest, and then as a bishop, and it goes on and on. So, bada bing, bada bang. Um, Clement wrote his letter to the Corinthians, perhaps before the year seventy A.D. Before the year seventy A.D. I know it's the textbooks say eighty A.D., but it could have been before seventy. Because we all know that Peter died in the 60s, possibly, yeah.
In his letter to the Romans, 81.10, Ignatius of Antioch remarked that he could not command the Roman Christians the way Peter and Paul commanded them. Such a comment making sense only if Peter was a leader. If Peter was no leader, he wouldn't have said that. So Peter and Paul was, were leaders in the church in, in varying degrees, I guess. Obviously, I mean, this is all we're getting at right now. It's Ignatius of Antioch in 11080, second century, the, really the end of the first, okay? Now let's look at Irenaeus. This was a pupil of John of Polycarp. Now Polycarp, Polycarp was a pupil of John the Evangelist. That's amazing, isn't it? Look at the connection, like a ripple of water. Polycarp was a pupil of John the Evangelist. Irenaeus was his son. Polycarp called Irenaeus his son. If you look at some of the writings. Um, now, of course, I don't think he meant the flesh and blood son. But in, tangentially, I guess he meant it in a spiritual way. Kind of like Paul in the scriptures calling, you know, when Jesus said, call no man your father. Really didn't mean call no man your father. Um, Paul clearly calls, says, you know, the sons I have begotten are, you know, have me as my father. I'm paraphrasing. Um, at any rate, um, so we have in Ignatius, in Irenaeus, against heresies, 8190, saying that Matthew wrote his gospel while Peter and Paul were evangelizing in Rome. This is quotations. So this is a Renaeus saying, talking, saying, Matthew wrote his gospel while Peter and Paul were evangelizing in Rome and laying the foundation of the church. Take a deep breath and think about that for a moment. Now, a few lines later, Irenaeus writes down the following. He says that Linus was named as Peter's successor. That is the second pope. Linus is the second pope. And that next in line were Anacletus, also known as Cletus, and then Clement of Rome. Most of these men died in persecutions and you know being martyred. Um, and the irony, the interesting thing is, the first fourteen popes of Rome were Jewish. We had Jewish popes in our history, in the Catholic Church's history. That's amazing. It's true. And yet, that was where the early church started. Early church came from Judea. Well, let's move on a little bit. Let's take a look and see who else has to say something about Peter here. We're talking about Clement of Alexandria wrote at the turn of the third century as a fragment of his work sketches is preserved in Eusebius uh, of Caesarea's ecclesiastical history. The first history of the church, Clement wrote, this is Clement writing, okay? When Peter preached the word publicly at Rome, this is another person talking, okay? Another early church father. 
and they weren't they were living together. Clement was in Rome. Irenaeus wasn't in Rome. And there were no cars back then. You know how long it took for someone to get from you know, one point in the east to the all the way to Rome. You know that little that thing that looks like a boot. You know, took a little while, right? But they knew because they wrote letters to each other, passed them around. So in a fragment that we have, Clement of Alexandria said very clearly, when Peter preached the word publicly at Rome and declared the gospel by the Spirit, many who were present requested that Mark, who had been for a long time his follower and remembered his saints, should write them down what had been proclaimed. And often some people do say that Mark was basically the secretary of Peter. Maybe Mark could have written first or second Peter. There is that not complete consensus. I mean, Peter could have written, what well, could have written him, Peter, but Mark knew Peter so well, he could have written for him. Like today, we have speech writers for the President of the United States of America. Now, you know, the only person getting, you know, the, the pat in the back are the President, but the person who wrote the actual Transcript was a speechwriter. So there, you know, even Peter had speechwriters. <laughs> um, there was a gentleman called Lactantius in a treatise called The Death of the Persecutors, written around 318. Now, folks, what I'm giving to you right now is history. Okay? History. I'm not giving you anything inerrant. History does not have to be inerrant. That's why in many lists of popes, Clement is, is listed third, sometimes he's listed fourth. Who cares? He's listed. All right? Who cares? Nothing is, you know, 2,000, okay. You know what? For 2,000 years, we've had a papacy. It's indisputable. Any historical book you look at, you'll find it. Any history book, I don't care where you go. And that's the premise of me talking to the person who said there were no popes before 606 AD. You know who you are if you're going to watch this video. Once I put it on YouTube, of course. <laughs> um, be aware that Peter was very much in Rome. It's laid out right here. I even there's even archaeological proof. We're going on forty minutes. It's going to be a little while. Hope you don't mind. So that it takes a little while. Peter the Rock took twenty five minutes because I was in I was pressed for time, so I was kind of bouncing around, you know. And we're going to go after this segment. We're going to go to. Um, we're going to try to do a second one. I'm, Peter's successors. We're not done yet by Peter by any stretch. Let's keep going. Now, understand that Nero, the persecutor of Christians, who made this big fake fire, and fake news, fake fire, <laughs> real fire, but blamed it on the Christians. He caused it, but blamed it on the Christians. Interesting, huh? He had to have a way to, you know, kill him. How are you going to kill someone who you can't prove did anything, right? Well, they did it to Jesus, but they convoluted a lot of things. All right, so let's go. Nero reigned from 54 AD to 68 approximately. Lactantius said, when Nero was already reigning between 54 and 68. 
approximately AD, Peter came to Rome where in virtue of the performance of certain miracles which he worked by that power of God which had been given to him, he converted many to righteousness and established a firm and steadfast temple to God. Where did he build this temple to God? Lactantius says it's called Rome. Well, where was Nero, folks? Nero was in Rome. Interesting, huh? Well, things kind of come together if we reading history here. I can't open up a book of history, by the way. You know, I can I can never find this anywhere where somehow it says in history that. Abraham Lincoln got up and started a fight with Booth, and Booth shot him because he was defending himself. And then Booth ran to the barn. I haven't heard that twist. I wonder why. Well, that's the kind of stuff I'm hearing a lot on the forum. And I'm hearing it everywhere. Folks, you know, I don't care who, if we're Protestant, if we're Catholic, let's be real with each other, okay? We want to have mutual trust and understanding. Let's be trustworthy to each other, you know. I know the Orthodox like to play games with, you know, some of us. The in individuals, not the patriarchs. The patriarchs have always been pretty smart. They knew exactly they know exactly what's going on. It's unfortunately the lay that sometimes like to spread rumors and innuendos. But when confronted with the truth, they clam up. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm I had to tell you how it is, or how it is. Wait till you find out how many Eastern bishops there are who talk about Peter down the road. You're going to be blown away. I don't think I hear that any anywhere now, but I, you know, who knows? Um, if you wish to know more about, you know. Peter's Roman residency, you can get that from Catholic Answers, okay? But you you always, if you if you go into their source, I think it's catholicanswers.com. When you go there, you understand that it's not, you're not reading just their opinion. You're also reading their, the early fathers of the church. You know, I go to Matt Slick's site. Interestingly enough, I'll read He's the early fathers of the church and what they had to say. And I'll agree with him. Yeah, they said that. The problem with Matt Slick's sight about the fathers when he's trying to get something across is he skips over a lot of stuff. Now, I can skip over a lot of stuff too if I wanted to. You know, I could, you know, geez, I could bounce around back and forth. If I, wanna, if I want to prove an untruth, I can prove it through the Bible. There are many cults that have done that. Trust me, there are. I'm not going to name any here. I think you can figure that out yourself. Many cults have claimed untruths from the Bible. They said things were there, never were there. Or they'll take a verse here and they'll, it's like copy and paste. Think about it, folks. Acts. Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, Titus, I mean, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 3 Peter, 1 John, 2, well, wait, I'm sorry, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, not 3 Peter. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelations. I just kind of mixed it up. Folks, you can't take one verse from 1 John and apply it to Romans. You can't take Romans and apply it to Corinthians. Paul was speaking when he was writing to certain, when he was writing letters to certain churches, he was writing to certain churches. He was, if he was writing a letter to the Corinthians, yes, it's inerrant, but it's to the Corinthians. It's to their issues, okay? If he's writing to Ephesians, it's because they're, it, he's got a situation to write to them. 
oftentimes he writes and says, I'm writing to you, but I will see you soon. I'm looking to tell you what I want to tell you. So Paul was more interested in speaking than writing. Second Thessalonians 2.15. Hold, Paul says this, hold fast to the teachings. You want to hear teachings? I'll, I'll use the word teaching. Tradition means teachings. Hold fast to the teachings you have received from us, be they by word of mouth or written letter. What do you think written letter is? This is the written letter, okay? This is the written letter. I don't have my catechism with me here, nor do I. Yeah, I do. Lucky me, huh? And I think I did this before. This is the oral teaching of the church. Oral teaching. Of course, it's um, written so that we can understand it. And I'm sure it's written in various compendiums. Let's get back to this here. I'm just um, trying to see where I'm going to go with this now. Um, we do show, I did speak earlier about the archaeological evidence that Peter was in Rome. But Botner, you know, Lorraine Botner, we're going to back, go back to Lorraine Botner because there's a lot of Lorraine Botners today. Say that they dismiss it, claiming Exhaustive research by archaeologists has been made down through the centuries to find some inscription in the catacombs and other ruins of ancient places in Rome that would indicate Peter at least visited Rome. But the only things found which gave any promise at all were some bones of uncertain origin. Okay, uncertain origin. How would he know what's certain if he said uncertain? clearly don't understand exactly what he's talking about, but I'll give him the respect needed. Roman Catholicism under Botner hit the presses in 1962. Um, the original book had revisions to it, uh, which failed to mention the result of the excavations under the high altar of St. Peter's the silica that had been underway for decades, but which were undertaken in earnest after World War II. What Lorraine Botner in that book, Roman Catholicism, says casually, what he ca when he casually dismissed as some bones of uncertain origin, were actually the contents of a tomb on Vatican Hill. Vatican Hill was as early as that was it was known even in the first century. That's where Peter was actually crucified on Vatican Hill. It was covered with early inscriptions attesting to the fact that Peter's remains were inside. Now these were archaeologists, they could have been atheists. They don't they, they don't have a ball, a dog in the hunt. I mean, it was like we have we had popes going down there digging, you know, scratching things on the wall or something. Come on, it's like saying, you know, recently we heard on the on the television that you know the moon landing was all fake. You know, it's just Hollywood. All right. Well, after the original release of Botner's book, evidence had mounted to the point. Now, evidence had mounted to the point that Pope Paul VI was able to announce officially, categorically, something that had been discussed in archeological literature. This is not something the Pope just sort of dreamed up. This can be found in archeological literature and religious publication for years, that the actual tomb of the first Pope 
had been identified conclusively, that his remains were apparently present and that in the vicinity of his tomb were inscriptions identifying the place as Peter's burial site, meaning the early Christians knew that the Prince of the Apostles was buried there. And the story of all of that with determination had to deal with scientific accuracy is too long to recount here. I mean, we just don't have the time here. I would encourage you folks to read John Evangelist Walsh's book, The Bones of St. Peter. Just Google it. John Walsh, The Bones of St. Peter. And you'll see there plenty of historical and scientific evidence that no one willing to look at the facts objectively can ever doubt that Peter was in New York. So we're going to kind of leave it at that. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can, I thought I had it written down actually. Um, give me one moment, okay? I know we're getting late, and I appreciate you folks being patient. Um, Now here we have, um, I believe this is Irenaeus. Yes, Irenaeus. And, and, and this is interesting. Let's, let's, let's take a look at this a little carefully. I, I'm going to read it to you. I want you to, I want you to hear it. I think you have, may have read this before, but it's really big. Well, maybe I'll cut it in half because some of it really doesn't have to do anything with us, but but since it would be too long to enumerate, Irenaeus writes. I remember Irenaeus being, we only got a few minutes. Irenaeus was the pupil or the son of Polycarp, which only wrote two letters, by the way. He didn't get a chance to eat that. Had his head cut off. Um, well, this is Irenaeus speaking, okay? Now, Peter, now, Irenaeus lived around 180 AD, 169, 179, 189, somewhere in that, in that round. Matthew also issued among the Hebrews a written gospel. True, he did. Matthew wrote a gospel. Matthew's gospel, right? They knew that in the second century. All right, 189 AD a written gospel in their own language, while Peter and Paul were evangelizing in Rome and laying the foundation of the church. This is Irenaeus talking. Who's going to call Irenaeus a liar? I don't think he had a dog in the hunt either. Well, let's just finish this up by going through a few of these quotes. Irenaeus comes up, goes out to say, but since it would be too long to enumerate in such a volume as this, the succession of all the churches, we shall confound all those who in whatever manner, whether through self-satisfaction or vainglory, or through blindness and wicked opinion, assemble other than where it is proper by pointing out here the succession of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to us. Notice what he says. Did we miss this? By pointing out here the succession of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient, most ancient, church known to all so in 189 the church was known to all 
founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. That church, which has the tradition and the faith, which comes to us, down to us, after having been announced to men by the apostles. So various apostles could have gone to Rome. Couldn't have, it may have not just been Peter. So he goes on to say something that's, we'll talk down the road, okay? Because it really doesn't, but it just because it has that connection with Rome, okay? With that church of Rome, because of its superior origin, this is Irenaeus talking, okay, not me. Irenaeus, you can look it up. Actually, it's, uh, you can look it up in Against Heresies, 311, I think it's chapter 3, you can look it up. Verse one, I don't know where it is. That, that, that's ch chapter three, probably it's marked as a one, okay? Under the subtext, perhaps. Now, he goes on to say, with that church of Rome, because of its superior origin, all churches must agree. That is, all the faithful in the whole world. And it is in her that the faithful everywhere have maintained the apostolic tradition. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Okay. The blessed apostles Peter and Paul having founded and built up the church in Rome. Um, by the way, Paul does make mention of the second pope of Rome. In 2 Timothy 4.21, where he says, To him he did Anacletus, and after him in the third place from the apostles, Clement was chosen for the episcopate. So, in, look, please read 2 Timothy 4.21. You'll find the mention of Linus in his letter. And that had to have been like, what, 45 AD, 50 maybe, because Paul would have died along, very close to Peter, around 60, maybe 58 AD. Well, let's go on. I just wanted to finish this part about, the, about Rome. Gaius in the early church, okay, um, 198 AD. It is recorded that Paul was beheaded in Rome itself. And Peter likewise, was crucified. Remember what Jesus said? Someone will take you where you do not wish to go. Tie your arms back. I'm paraphrasing again. And will take you where you do not want to go. It's in there. So Peter was crucified during the reign of the Emperor Nero. This is Gaius talking, an early church father, writer, dignitary, Christian, of course. The account is confirmed by the names of Peter and Paul over the cemeteries there. This is, this is Gaius talking. That the account is confirmed by the names of Peter and Paul over the cemeteries in Rome, which remain to the present time indeed during the excavation they were found. Paul's remains are in, if I'm not mistaken, um, either the Basilica of Paul or I believe it's, it could be, I have to do some research on that, but it's in, it's in, it's in Rome. It's in Rome. Or Latter, a second Lateran Council, or Lateran Council. I mean, Lateran, the Lateran Church Basilica. I, I have to look at that. Um, I'll get back to you on that. So that, I mean, it, right here, I mean, that is, this is a disputation with Proclus 198. 
in Eusebius church history. Um, I guess Gaius quotes this. Now uh, here's Clement of Alexandria, the circumstances which occasion the writing of Mark were these. When Peter preached the word publicly at Rome and declared the gospel by the Spirit, many who were present requested that Mark, who had been a long time his follower and who remembered his writings should write down what had been proclaimed, which would help understand that maybe it was Mark. Yeah, Mark. Did I just mention Mark? Hmm. Getting later right here, I got it. Okay, yeah, Mark. Mark very well may have written first and second Peter. And I I know the general answer to that. There's a various consensus on that. Mark's basically wrote them down and had been proclaimed. This is uh, 200 AD. Um, and we got Tertullian saying the same thing, but if you are near Italy, you have Rome, there are authorities at hand for us to, what a happy church that is, on which the apostles poured out their whole doctrine with their blood. Where Peter had a passion like that of the Lord, where Paul was crowned with the death of John, John the Baptist, the same way, being beheaded. And that's the demurrer against the heretics, 36 AD 200, Tertullian. I'm going to, I, I, I got to stop at some point. I don't want to keep you guys bored. But you know, here's Cyril of Jerusalem. How about this? It's the Eastern Father. Simon Magus so deceived the city of Rome that Claudius erected a statue of him. While the error was extending itself, Peter and Paul arrived, a noble pair and the rulers of the church, and they set that the error straight. They launched the weapon of their like-mindedness and prayer against Magus or Magus and struck him down to earth. It was marvelous enough and yet no marvel at all, for Peter was there. He that carries about the keys of heaven. Oh, we're going to talk about that. What a blast with that one. This is Cyril. This is an Eastern Church father talking. Peter had the keys. Wrote it right here. And yet no marvel at all. For Peter was there. He that carries the keys of heaven. And it was nothing to marvel at, for Paul was there, he that was caught up into the third heaven. See how there's levels of order in, in the structure of the church? Yeah, you, you'll see Peter and Paul was in Rome. They both didn't have the same authority. Paul himself calls Peter, you know, he withstood Peter to the face. What does he say to him in Aramaic? Cephas. I withstood Cephas to the face, because he was clearly raw. There was nothing dogmatic that he was wrong about. He was simply hypocritical. You could be wrong hypocritical. Came, left one table and went to sit with another group. Well, I'm not going to point out that any further about that. You can read that in scriptures. And we got Optatius. You cannot deny that you are aware that in the city of Rome, the Episcopal chair was given first to Peter. The chair in which Peter sat. Wow, folks, we hear about Peter being on the chair. Peter in the chair. That's authoritative language, folks. 350 AD, 4th century. Okay, I know. You know what? Things open up a little bit when you're not being persecuted and hounded like a dog. But for 300 years, you're not going to be writing a lot of stuff that is going to be, you know, able to connect, you know, the Romans to people that can kill you. All right. So maybe, you know, people opened up a little more after three, three, 313 AD of the Edict of Milan. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh, 
I can I can go on and on, folks. Honestly, I mean, Jerome, Simon Peter, the son of John, born in Bethsaida. I mean, from the village of Bethsaida, the village of Galilee, brother of Andrew, the apostles, and himself chief of the apostles. Nobody doubts that chief of the apostles. After having, after having been bishop of the Church of Antioch, yes, Peter was bishop of the Church of Antioch, and he ordained a bishop in Antioch. Doesn't mean that he was at that. That's his see. Do you know how many churches Jesus, Paul, um, Peter, and Paul ordained bishops in? Are they all their sees? Come on, folks, don't listen to some this garbage out there, please. Read what I'm reading. Read early church fathers. Get the Jurgens book. It's a, it's a beginner. So we got, you know, so basically I look at them. Jerome, Simon Peter, the son of John. Okay. Brother of Andrew the Apostle and himself chief of the apostles. After having been bishop of the church of Antioch. Yes, he was there. So he had to ordain someone in his place, right? Of course. After having preached to the dispersion, pushed on to Rome in the second year of Claudius to overthrow Simon Magus and held the sacerdotal chair there for 25 years until the last that is the 14th year of Nero. Again, how many times did we hear Nero already by these early church fathers that are spread out all over the place? They all say the same thing. Well, I mean, I think I, I think you know, going to Augustine. I think we all know what we're going to hear there. So, I'm going to end it here, folks. If you have any questions, again, like I said, go to the forum. I'm going to put a little link on the post, and I'm going to ask you to please ask any questions you want on the residency of Peter. Um, where was Peter? Where where was he? You know, I just. Went through everything. I think that the biggest place you need to go look, honestly, read, get the book. Get the book that I asked you, uh, talked to you about. Um, his name is John Evangelist Walsh. Y'all know how to spell evangelist, right? John Evangelist Walsh, The Bones of St. Peter. Get that book. I'm gonna, if I'm going to find that link, I'll put it on, I'll post it as well. Has all the scientific, all the archaeological evidence for you. Folks, Peter was in Rome. It's categorical, conclusive. All right, we're done. I want to wish you all a very nice Friday. I want to thank those of you who stood with me and listened. And if you have any questions, like I said, please feel free to list on your post. Thank you very much. God bless you. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you all.